At the turn of the 20th century, there was a significant labor movement where workers actively sought to improve their workplaces and bargaining power. Although compensation for occupational injuries is not a new idea, the way it is currently implemented is partly due to the tragic story of the Radium Girls, a group of female employees of the U.S. Radium Corporation who were harmed on the job and unable to work again. Radium was a popular element in the early 1900s due to its self-luminescence and medical uses. Many products including toothpaste, cosmetics, and over-the-counter medications claimed to contain radium and offered health benefits. During World War I, the U.S. Radium Corporation sold glow-in-the-dark watch dials coated with radium under the brand name Undark and later sold them to the general public. USRC upper management avoided handling radioactive material and hired over 4,000 workers, predominantly women, to paint watch dials with radium. At their Orange, New Jersey factory, 300 painters were assigned to paint 250 dials daily for a penny and a half each. The watch dials were painted by dial painters who had to make their paint and use fine-tipped camel hair brushes. USRC instructed the painters to lip dip paint to prevent the brushes from losing their points too quickly. The painters sometimes passed the time by painting their faces, nails, and teeth with fluorescent paint, which management believed was safe. One employee, Grace Fryer, noticed her handkerchief lit up green when she blew her nose after a long day at the plant. Dentists in and near Orange, New Jersey saw an influx of new patients in 1922 who complained of tooth pain and loose teeth. The body treats radium as calcium and distributes it to the skeletal system because it interacts with other elements like calcium. The dentists discovered their patients' jaw bones were peppered with holes after subjecting them to further radiation in the form of early x-rays. In the worst circumstances, their jaws could deteriorate to the point where they split off from the top of their skull. Radium jaw would later be the name given to this ailment. By 1924, 12 of the 50 women who worked at the orange plant had passed away. The USRC management responded to the crisis by threatening legal action against doctors who disclosed their findings on the causes of death of their painters. In some cases, doctors were intimidated into changing the cause of death to STIs. When Grace Fryer's doctor suggested that her work at the watch factory may have contributed to her medical concerns, US USRC had her examined by a toxicologist with no medical training who declared her completely healthy. Arthur Roeder, president of the USRC, launched an effort to quell the mounting anxiety. He employed married Harvard School of Public Health researchers Cecil and Catherine Drinker to investigate the working conditions at the factories. The drinkers conducted staff testing while touring USRC sites. Naturally, they discovered that practically all of them had rare blood disorders. Dr. Edward Lehman, the head chemist at USRC, frequently handled radium without gloves, which led to sores on his hands. He rejected the drinkers' recommendations for safety gear and passed away shortly after.
According to Cecil and Catherine Drinker, many USRC staff, especially dial painters, consumed harmful and potentially deadly levels of radioactive material. They reported their findings and suggestions to Rotor, who became angry and threatened to sue if the study was released. The drinkers relented. Rotor tampered with the report and falsely stated that the dial painters were in excellent health. He sent this version to the New Jersey Department of Labor. However, Alice Hamilton, a Harvard classmate of the Drinkers, had acquaintances at the National Consumers League, an organization that had already started an independent investigation of the working conditions at USRC. When Hamilton learned that the Drinkers had a copy of Rotor's falsified report, she let them know. They immediately publicized the results. After the truth became public, the harmed employees began to look for restitution. Many of them had astronomical medical debt, and some of them were no longer able to work. Grace Fryer started looking for a lawyer in 1925. However, there was only a two-year statute of limitations for workplace accidents, and Fryer had already moved to another position. Additionally, Fryer, a working-class member, lacked influence, whereas USRC, a large corporation, had the resources to hire skilled lawyers. It took her two years to locate a lawyer to take her matter seriously. Raymond Berry, a fresh-faced lawyer in Newark, agreed to take on the litigation. The other dial painters, and the husband, Albina Loris, Kinta McDonald and Katherine Schwab joined the investigation. They each asked for a $250,000 settlement. The lawsuit immediately gained public attention. Newspaper reportage, especially that of the New York world, increased sympathy greatly. After learning about the situation, dentist Joseph P. Neff, who had previously treated dial painter Amelia McGee, had the jawbone of his deceased patient scanned for radiation. It was all around him. Even Marie Curie heard about it and voiced her sorrow. She sadly told the patients that they would never be able to get rid of the radium in their bodies, but advised them to consume raw liver to prevent radiation poisoning symptoms. In 1934, Curie herself passed away from radiation-related issues. I removed her jawbone, not by an operation, but merely by putting my fingers in her mouth and lifting it out. Whenever a portion of the infected bone was removed, instead of arresting the course of narcosis, it sped it up. Joseph Neff, Magia's dentist. By January of 1928, all five radium girls were too weak to raise their arms for the oath. Fryer had lost all of her teeth and needed a brace to sit. The next hearing was scheduled for April, but the dial painters were too ill to attend. Meanwhile, many USRC's witnesses were summering in Europe. The judge adjourned the case until September. The dial painter's health was rapidly declining, and their survival past September was uncertain. Barry and USRC settled out of court for $10,000 in compensation a $600 yearly income, and medical bill reimbursement for each radium girl. Each of the radium girls passed away over the next 10 years, but their legacy lives on. As a result of the case, five women successfully sued the radium dial company in Illinois. Watch manufacturers began to provide protective gear and instruction in the safe use of radioactive materials to their staff. 
Thanks in part to the efforts of Raymond Berry and Alice Hamilton, who helped negotiate better conditions for radium dial painters. In 1949, Congress passed a law extending the statute of limitations and ensuring compensation for occupational illnesses. By the 1970s, tritium watches, which are much safer, replace radium watches as the preferred material. Self-luminous watch dials, typically composed of non-radioactive strontium aluminate, are still produced. The Radium Girls' contribution to receiving compensation for work-related illnesses remains significant despite their occupation being outdated. Some may not consider this a crime. However, I thought it should be added. I consider this a crime because the company knew this was a poisonous substance. Many of the company owners would not handle this substance. As of 10 years ago, there was still some radium girls alive from different parts of the world. These grandmothers had all sorts of different kinds of cancer. They had skin cancer and breast cancer. We had the radium girls and their unwilling sacrifice to thank for our right to compensation for illnesses contracted in the workplace. Tell me, what are your thoughts?